Where do they end up, these poetic gems that you so cruelly discard? The genuine pearls that you cast away without a second thought, with such nonchalance, like at the end of a summer romance. The superfluous syllables, the scored out stanzas that didn't get a reprieve, the strained simile, the smudged out sentence, you make all of them walk the plank. The convoluted couplets, the misplaced metaphor, the obscure octave, the vestigial verse, will all face the guillotine. What you once thought was the definitive draft, the penultimate phrase, the magnum opus, that were all so good to go. You review them again, now with new eyes. The beleaguered beginning and the elongated end, the bloated middle that now seems to distend. As brevity beckons, you rip out fleshy pounds, taking an ax to the tree, excising all exuberance, at times cutting too deep, like with fingernails cut to the quick. These are the QC rejects, the shop house seconds, the also rans, the nearly made it but not quite, the runts of the litter that now contemplate the knife. Mesmerized by minimalism, you will turn a blind eye to the plankton that swish around in the swill, the flotsam and the jetsam. You distance yourself from their death throes that fall on your own deaf ears as they flip-flop around like fish out of water, gasping for breath on the floors of some Aegean stable that you think you have completely cleansed. This is where their tiny voices are reborn, the ones that are now in your head, the ones that will haunt you, constantly taunt and torment you, the ones that will not go away. Banished to the extremities, to the innermost recesses of your mind, these scalped words and radiant rhymes regroup and reassemble, recalcitrant and resilient, resuscitated and resurrected, popping up when you least expect it, like the sword and the arm thrust out at you by some lady in a lake as you sleepwalk its shores, as you seek to step into some new power, to greedily grab and to grasp the exact words somehow escape you as your muse sinks slowly back. Although for one moment you could have sworn you felt the kick, you did feel something move like a poem whose time had finally come. Red Shift. Uh, Slightly unusual title, and therefore unusual titles lead to unusual backstories. And a collaborator of mine uh, by the name of Crystal Oh, who is a South Korean-based uh, artist and photographer, sent me a photograph. Uh, and when I got that photograph, I said, what is that? And she said, that's Red Shift. I was immediately transported back to my high school classroom where, of course, like every other student of physics, I had heard about redshift and the Doppler effect uh, and the movement of between object and observer for wavelength as well as sound. And all of those constructs came together into this poem uh, called Redshift. You are the first cab off the rank. I'm running on empty in my tank. You revved up sped away fifth gear, me and my cab left standing here. The abyss between us gets wider still, your Doppler screams turn less shrill. In the camera replay I seem to drift, your rear view only shows red shift. The, the quandary I faced was how do we ever discover a cover that will match uh, to the title Red Shift, and we looked high and low. It was sort of like Finding uh, Nemo, the movie. And we searched and we searched, and I had a whole crew, my friends, family, and we scoured the internet, but just couldn't come up with a high-resolution image that uh, would be worthy of the title or worthy of the book. Ultimately, I had this eureka moment where I said, why not break it up into Red and Shift? And uh, what happened as a result of that was I wrote a second poem called Red, shift about uh, lovers and the lady is dressed in red 
and uh, you can see she's walking away from somebody she's quite intimate with, but they're both going their separate ways through portals and doorways. They're walking away from each other without so much as a, a backward glance. And uh, my second poem, Red Shift, is what inspired this wonderful painting uh, by one of uh, South Korea's most famous contemporary artists, uh, Mr. Lim Seung Hyun. And uh, it's really a marvelous painting, which brings out the whole uh, essence of red shift of uh, a gap or an abyss or a rift, uh, in this case, between pers two persons. And uh, that's how sort of high school physics, if you will, gets transformed into something which is quite emotive. So the second reading on Redshift, but this is the dress, Redshift. The dress that I once bought you as a gift hangs heavy and refuses to dance and lift. When the wind died, the breeze went adrift. The distance between us now grows to a rift. We have moved away, remorseless and swift, wearing our empty garments, you a red shift. Um, as the previous uh, two poems showed, or certainly the first version of red shift uh, demonstrated, um, my passion or obsession with uh, uh, things mathematical or uh, surrounding physics, astronomy, and geometry, uh, all of that sort of permeates my poetry even today. I hope that I'm not scaring away uh, everybody who run away from science after grade, after grade 10, but hopefully the emotional content uh, will bring them back in. So, Hubble. Seeking heaven in the Hubble and salvation through a keyhole. Outer space will soon be rubble, simply nothing can make whole. So capture sunlight in brief snatches through your kaleidoscope of light. Gaze long to see the color patches although for now it seems all white. There's a sense of tongue-in-cheek humor to a lot of my poetry, and uh, that comes through in a number of my poems, and the one I'm about to share with you now, or next, uh, called Clouds, um, is probably symbolic of that. So, Clouds. I have snipped away from the firmament above, cutting carefully along the dotted lines my own little patch of cloud and sky. I wear it on my lapel. It suits me. I carry it about me, come rain or shine, a perfect pocket square of blue and white, curly cirrus and azure, where the sea and surf that dwell in the sky are like squabbling siblings hugging the hypotenuse. These days, I have my head in the clouds. I can be a rainmaker or even a party pooper if I so choose. I can coax cats and dogs to rain on your parade, or just be your fair weather friend, if that's what you'd prefer. I can shape shift to stratus, stacking up layers to me you will never fathom, or conjure comfortable cumulus, drifting downy and fluffy. Careful now, for I am but the calm before the storm. But pay heed, for I will burst forth soon, nasty, and nimbus, like a berserker, above the tumult, you will hear my battle cry of violent Vivaldi violins, where an ominous autumn has yielded to a wind gone wild. I trust you lie leeward and safe of this tempest that I ride. So, sort of the transition from uh, relationships breaking up, and we, uh, you know, everyone, listeners, readers, viewers, at some stage in your life, you go through uh, heartache and breakup, but grief from bereavement has a different aspect to it uh, because uh, it's difficult to uh, recover from that. And uh, the next poem I'm going to uh, read out to you is called Her Crossing. And um, my uh, collaborator, Anita Thomas, lost her mother a couple of years ago, and uh, um, uh, this poem is dedicated uh, to her. And the backstory is quite interesting. Um, as she was uh, dealing with her illness and uh, just wanted to um, be distracted or have something to do, she would borrow uh, the works of Alexander McCall Smith, a very well-known 
uh, Zimbabwean-based uh, originally uh, author who wrote uh, uh, about uh, a lady detective uh, based in Botswana. So one of the books had the title Tears of a Giraffe, and I just uh, landed in Perth at the, at the time when the news of uh, Anita's mother passing away uh, got to us, and uh, uh, it was just two words, uh, uh, you know, mummy's gone, and inherent in that was uh, all the grief, and uh, I was thinking of my uh, connection and the books I'd lent, and one of the books had a title, Tears of a Giraffe, and I thought that was quite appropriate. One aspect uh, about this dear old lady was that uh, she was always immaculately turned out, even when she was really unwell and seriously ill. Uh, she took great pains uh, to make sure that she uh, was turned out very well. There wasn't any crumple or wrinkle to her clothes, so uh, the, the poem describes that. So her crossing. <clears throat> she sinks back slowly, no ripple, no eddy, not a wrinkle to her clothes. Drifting deep into double comfort, the mattress and the duvet that she would sometimes pull up all the way to her chin, to her creaseless cherubic face. These bed sheets now hold the imprint of her glow. A warm mold you will burrow into sometime soon when nobody's looking, pulling up your knees till they reach your chin. It will only be much later that you will come across her tears, woven into the fabric of your grief, caught between the weft and the warp, you will find the tears of the giraffe. This may seem little, perhaps, but it will be little enough. What beyond uh, redshift, and uh, for me, COVID-19, all the lockdowns, the circuit breaker was a, a, a fairly productive period where I was able to outturn uh, with the help of uh, Kitab International, three other books, uh, Why Now, uh, Seen and Felt, which is a collaboration with, in fact, uh, five separate Korean artists, two, two of whom I've, I've referred to earlier. The fourth book, which is uh, a uh, collaboration between photography and poetry with Anita Thomas is likely to be, again, published by Kitab in uh, January next year. So there's plenty to keep me busy, but also, um, inherent in sort of uh, a poem or a work of art or a painting, each individual work actually never gets finished. And in that sense, uh, your uh, journey as a poet or an artist is never complete. And this constant striving for perfection or searching for, if you will, uh, you know, the paradise uh, is never quite achieved. And I think uh, that sort of spurs you on to your next work. And, Hopefully that'll be the same for me. So uh, beyond Redshift, uh, I personally feel that there's a whole lot more waiting out there for me to discover. The last reading today uh, is inspired by a wonderful sculptor by the name of Jonathan Borowski, and uh, uh, a work of his um, is featured on the Carnegie Mellon campus. And I do hope that uh, when we're all able to resume travel uh, someday that you'll all be able to see this wonderful piece of sculpture, but certainly inspired by that and uh, out of reach. Maybe heaven's just a crow's nest that we scale some mast to reach, and all your life's just one big test with heaven staying out of reach. Thank you. Poetry and banking, they say, make for strange bedfellows, uh, but I'd probably like to gently challenge that contention and kind of try and debunk that myth, if you will. And uh, I guess my favorite example would be to quote the example of T.S. Eliot, and he was clearly a huge inspirational uh, force in my life, uh, one of my boyhood heroes as I took to poetry. And surprise, surprise, he was both a banker and a poet.